it really, it's a losing trade on every single element of it is a losing trade. And you're buying at the absolute peak of an end, you know, 30, 40 years of, of real estate boom. So you're buying at the absolute top of the market. You're tying yourself down for 30 years with a mortgage. And so what? So you can have a dinner party and say you own this house? Right. I mean, that, that's pretty much it, right? It's just like your social signaling is like, and, you know, I would say you need to get those ideas out of your brain, get into an idea that it's how much you have in your ledger that counts, not how much house you have. You know, you're sitting there in a crappy house and they are crappy. They're not they even are. great. They are terrible. They're all, they're all, what do they call them? Dog boxes or whatever? Yep. They call. Dog boxes. That's what they call them. Dog boxes. Like they're, they're, they're junky things. You know, you're sitting there going, it's great. And objectively, it's not great. 100%. Today's video features my latest interview with entrepreneur and mathematician, Fred Krueger. Fred is currently the fastest growing Bitcoiner in the space. The full interview is packed with Fred's predictions if you want to watch the full interview. We discuss his price prediction for Bitcoin in 2025, why you should not buy a house, and finally, why it should be your top priority to accumulate one whole Bitcoin before it's too late. Also, before we jump in, if you want to stay up to date with the latest in the Bitcoin and crypto world, subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Crypto Nutshell. It's a five minute email that delivers the latest expert predictions from thought leaders like Sailor, Breaking News and Top on Chain Analysis. To join, click the first link in the description, enter your email and start receiving the newsletter in your inbox every morning. It's the easiest way to stay informed and become a better crypto investor in 2024. But without further ado, let's jump in with Fred Krueger. Why don't you take your 20 million, okay, and buy 200 Bitcoin? Yeah, what, what, how about that? Bro, good yeah, luck convincing be... anyone of that in Australia. Um, I want to jump into this because there's a tweet I want to read out that you did a few days ago and I loved it because me and my friend sat down when we really got into Bitcoin in 21 and we crunched the numbers between because we were at the age where a lot of our friends, they're buying their first house and I don't know what it's like in the States, but there's a huge culture around investing in real estate and getting your first house. There's, it's mm -hmm. So much of the Australian economy is built around owning real estate and so much of the economy is propped up by oh. it. Everyone is real estate crazy and my sister's about to buy a house and I've been trying my best to convince them. You tweeted out that real estate is going to severely underperform Bitcoin over the next two decades. It won't even be close. Smart people will rent their entire life. The idea of buying a house will be for losers. I would love for you to help me convince my friends and my sister about how bad of a trade getting a house and very, premium that okay, they command okay, so, versus Bitcoin. So does your sister expect to live another 20 years? I would assume, yes, she would. Right, okay, right. So let's take a 20 year horizon, okay? She buys a house right now. How much is a house is she, she gonna buy? The median house price in Australia is a million dollars. Okay, so let's just say a million Aussie, right? Yep. Okay, she's gonna spend a million Aussie on a house, okay? How much is that house gonna be worth 20 years from now? Best His, case. Historically, they go up 7% a year. So best case in 20 years, it'd be worth two mil, two and a half. But I don't think they go up at the same rate they've been going up. Okay. So I mean, let's say it doubles, right? Two and a half, like double. Let's say it triples. We're worth three million, right? How? Wh what do we think of Bitcoin is going to be in, a, in 20 years? Millions. No, it's, it's going to be worth 10 million. It's going to be 100x. It's going to be 100x, okay? You're gonna make a hundred X just by putting your thing in your ledger and just waiting 20 years. With the house, you're gonna put it in, you're gonna have house repairs, you're gonna have real estate taxes, you're gonna have tenant issues, you might have like floods, you know, you, you could have fires, you know. There's a fire going on here in Malibu right now. Malibu, great place. Houses, your house, you just bought a house, burning down. We had a guy in here last night, yesterday. Guys, like, I can see the smoke from my house. Like, you know, like, okay. So you got that to, you got that to take into account. So you got all that. And you know what? Are we going to be more mobile or less mobile in, in our lives in, in the next decades? More mobile. More mobile, right? Your sister may decide she doesn't even want to live in Australia. She may want to decide to go to Thailand, right? 
or Venezuela, right? Which might become the new hotbed, you know, or Argentina, you know, like we're going to be moving all around and you can work now from anywhere, right? You can do work literally from anywhere. You want to buy on Market Street in San Francisco? You buy a house. Now you have to deal with a homeless guy defecating right in front of your house. That's your new reality. That's David Sachs's reality. He buys these houses, like he's got to deal with these homes. So I think it's just like, it really, it's a losing trade on every single element of it is a losing trade. And you're buying at the absolute peak of an end, 30, 40 years of, of real estate boom. So you're buying at the absolute top of the market you're tying yourself down for 30 years with a mortgage. And so what? So you can have a dinner party and say you own this house? It's just like your social signaling is like, you need to get those ideas out of your brain, get into an idea that it's how much you have in your ledger that counts, how much house you have. You know, you're sitting there in a the crappy house and they are crappy. They're not they even are. great. They are terrible. They're all, they're all, what do they call them? Dog boxes or whatever? Yep. They call. Dog boxes. That's what they call them. Dog boxes. Like they're, they're, they're junky things. You know, you're sitting there going, it's great. And objectively, it's not great. A hundred percent. There's yeah. two tailwinds that property and housing, at least in Australia, and I imagine the US is the exact same thing, has had over the last 30, 40 years that real estate has essentially just gone straight up. And that is population growth and immigration. And if you extrapolate that out over the next few decades, these aren't massive drivers of growth for real estate anymore either. I know uh, with Trump being elected, he's really cracking down on immigration. I know it's a huge issue in Australia. So this huge wave of demand that historically has been a well, driver. The other thing is work at home, right? Yes, true as well. Right. How many times do you need to go to downtown Sydney to do something anymore? You don't need to. You can do everything. You get your food delivered from Amazon. It doesn't matter, right? Yep. Like you can live anywhere you want. If you can, but you know, look, so you can live in some remote beach community somewhere and you're, you make friends. People will find, you know, it's sort of like New York, smart artists and all these cool people in the sixties lived in Soho, but it was super cheap. Nobody wanted to live in Soho, right? Then it became like super expensive. Louis Vuitton, you know, like, you know, like, and you know what? It's completely uninteresting. There's nothing interesting. So, you know, the smart, cool people are always going to go where the other guys aren't. I saw this interview with Tim Cook, you know, from Apple once, and they said, what kind of guy are you? And he goes, well, you know, I realized one thing in life. Yes, I realized that in life, if you do what everybody else is doing, that doesn't usually lead to really good idea, good outcomes. You really have to sort of think like for yourself and do just swim against the tide. Or I think he's right. Like you know, like just be. There is if t everybody's telling you to go buy real estate, do the opposite. Do exactly the opposite. That's probably a really good general rule. Don't start a company. If everybody's saying get get a serious job, then do don't do it. People are like, even including my parents, were like, "Why are you doing that? Like, what's the, why do you need?" I'm like, what? I like math. Like, I'd like to do some more complex math. And I'm like, you know, like people are like, well, what 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 are you gonna do with that? And I was like, I have no idea. I don't care. I like it. You know, I like math. So now, of course, when I was a completely starving. Stanford graduate student and like my friends were getting jobs at Booz Allen Hamilton and you know as consultants making absurdly high salaries of a hundred thousand dollars a year back then and I was like you know just eating ramen and solving equations yeah I, I looked like I might have been doing the wrong trade but it eventually worked out you know like so I think that you got to go against the grain do what everybody is not doing that's my advice in general look at the outcomes it's had in your life 10 10 plus exits um now early to Bitcoin incredibly successful entrepreneur and investor um I think that's a good motto to always be thinking about is go against the crowd and go against what everyone is thinking well, you have some inner voice that tells you something to actually follow that you know don't do what everybody else is telling you to do but just try to like, you know, well, your inner voice and just kind of have fun. Like, you know, part of, part of my thing, like with Twitter, people are like, well, how did you get so big on Twitter? I'm like, because I have a lot of fun on Twitter. I, I really enjoy making these videos and doing stupid stuff and making jokes and making people laugh. There's people that check the feed every minute. And then there are people who pretend 
that they don't care and they check their feed in secret every minute. But, you know, I, I'm like that. I'm checking every. And so like, you know, <laughs> this is so true. I'm both. No, it's like yeah. I only every minute in bull markets, like picking in the bear market. That's the fun thing about this community is like we're all in this together in a way, and we're all in it separately, but we're all kind of living through the same thing. We all have the same emotions. We have the exactly same, you know, fears. Everybody says, yeah, I have one Bitcoin, one Bitcoin. And really, really, you say that, but when the market's down, you don't say that anymore, right? So the potential Bitcoin strategic reserve, I don't know if you caught, were you able to watch Eric Trump's speech at Bitcoin? Okay. Or, I didn't watch the whole thing, it's on my list, yeah. What do you think are the odds that, and I know on, uh, I think Poly Market, they have 30% odds that he, introduces it in the first 100 days. I think if if that's accurate and it is a 30% chance, the market is way underestimating this potential huge catalyst if Bitcoin does this strategic reserve. Do you think it's going to happen or do you think it's a long shot? What are your thoughts on it? I don't know. I think it's probably going to happen. You know, the, the real question is, does Trump want to fight that battle really hard? He's got a bunch of other battles that he wants to do. It's not like at the absolute top of his agenda. In my opinion, I think the, you know, the immigration thing is going to be more top of immigration. You know, that that's probably the number one. I think he's going to deal with Ukraine. I, I wouldn't say it's an afterthought, but I don't, don't think it's like not a priority. I think what we've got here is a very pro crypto administration. I think we're going to see a gradual end to this operation choke point. If you're thinking, oh, we're going to get this thing and we're going to have a spike up, I sort of tamper, I would temper your your expectations a little bit. Like, I think we're going to have a very good year next year, but I don't think we're going to have this thing where you should leverage and try to bet for like some big, you know, moment. I think we have all good things, but yeah, the Bitcoin reserve might not happen the first hundred days. If it doesn't, then it hurt me. It doesn't, you know, like I do think he'll do at a minimum. I think he'll say like, you know, those Silk Road Bitcoin things that we have, we're going to put them in the preserve. I think that we could get, you know, for them to start going on a massive buying spree. I think they need to kind of get within 100 days. That seems a little aggressive to me. They're going to start spending money on Bitcoin. Like MSNBC is going to go completely insane if they do it. Very true. Very true. Believe that. Like, what? We're spending money on Bitcoin. Like, <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. I imagine that they said, We've just spent a billion dollars on Bitcoin. Like people are going to be like protest in American cities. Like no on Bitcoin, no on Bitcoin, no more Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, that would be mountains a hundred percent. Feed our people. No more Bitcoin. Stop Fred Krueger. You know. You'll be enemy number one. Um, oh yeah. I mean, they'll be like. Kruger, he's just trying to sell his bags to us. I know. I'll, you know what? They'll probably invite me on. Like, Mr. Kruger, you're here. You're promoting this nonsensical program. You just want to sell your bags to us, right? <laughs>